Uh, I'm again really happy and super excited to welcome Karina Stukin today. Uh, Karina is a product leader, writer, and speaker with a background in development and user experience work, uh, both sides that I you know, find, find fascinating in a product, great product manager uh, to have from a skill side side. She's the recent author of a really great ebook, The Insights Driven Product Manager, and also the VP product at Rome Digital, and previously led a wide range of B2B and B2C products across different regions of the world. Uh, for lots of different companies, including Commonwealth Bank Australia, eBay, eBay, sorry, <laughs> ASB Bank, and Fletcher Building. Uh, so welcome, Karina, and uh, I will pass things over to you and uh, looking forward to your session today. Well, thanks so much, Scott, um, for the lovely intro. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, yeah, really excited to be here today. Um, I'll just start putting my slides up. Give me one second. Um, hopefully you can see that all good. All good. Awesome. Um, cool. So yeah, the topic today is uh, the importance of having good metrics. Um, I've been doing talks about this topic for a while now, and I would usually go into like the nitty gritties of like how to do metrics better and how to do product analytics. And I think people always appreciated that, but then I noticed somehow I haven't really conveyed the, the true importance of why metrics are actually so fundamental to everything we do as product leaders. And I'd often find product managers and teams just kind of measuring things for the sake of measuring things without really getting the true insights and the true value from their metrics. So that's why today I want to spend um, a bit more time on just the kind of the fundamentals on why we should really care about good metrics practices. And then we'll actually go into some of the metrics fundamentals, how to do metrics better and how to also get more insights from your metrics. And as Scott mentioned in this part, I am hoping to do a few exercises as well where you can use a chat function to kind of um, uh, share some ideas uh, on, on good metrics practices. So yeah, hoping to really make this a little bit interactive and fun today as well, rather than just me talking at you. Cool, so I'll start with a funny story. Last year, I was part of like an analytics focused panel actually with a few other product leaders. Um, and there was this product manager who was leading this team that was focusing on activation uh, of their customers. So I won't name the company. He was leading a, a team for a very, one of the largest technology companies. Um, so their team was focused on ensuring that their customers were doing a certain action within the first three days of signing up to their product. Um, and then when I asked, uh, as part of the discussion, I asked, okay, how did you guys actually arrive at, you know, defining this activation metric? Like, why did you choose this metric? And their response was <laughs> um, that they're just focusing on um, the customer problems and the customer experience. The, the metric was actually set by the business stakeholders and the commercial team because you know the commercials that's that's and the business goals that's part of like the other team <laughs> um so there was this real disconnect between or he, he made this big disconnect between the product team and the business stakeholder um so this was kind of my reaction when i heard it <laughs> um i really noticed that you know, his business stakeholders were talking, and I see this all the time, they were talking about financial and operational targets and metrics, and they're actually often very data-driven, right? Um, they look at numbers all day, every day, because they're looking at the business, um, business growth and revenue and so on and so forth. And then the product team comes along, and we talk about, you know, customer problems and maybe our future usage metrics. So, for example, how many customers are using our new feature that we just launched or how many people are dropping off on our onboarding funnel. And so now that part, it's really important as well, of course, but you can really see the, the kind of disconnect between the business and the product and the different metrics and the different language that we kind of use in the day-to-day. -day. So to me, this is where the real power of good metrics comes in. Good metrics allow us to link product features to business impact. 
So imagine the product manager from the analytics panel would actually get a deeper understanding of, well, what are our commercial financial goals for the year? What revenue numbers are we trying to hit? Or are there new segments that we're going after? And then he could go back into his activation metrics and the or the things that his users would do in the first three days of signing up. Maybe he would even find some new correlations between other, you know, maybe a specific target segment like the enterprise customers would do another action um, that might be a really good activation metric that then leads to future business growth. So you can see like the opportunities there are endless if we really try to kind of link those two worlds closer together. Now, this was obviously in the large company, so I often see in, in large enterprises I work with, this disconnect is huge, but it does happen in smaller companies as well. Um, I think we've done a great job as product people to be really close to our customers, but somehow I often still see this hesitation to you know, do things, to work closer with our business and, and commercial stakeholders in the business. And this is you know, one story and one anecdote and my experience, but I, I want to highlight that this is really a wider issue. Um, the, there was a great study came out in 2020 um, from the state of product analytics, which showed that only 10% of product teams are able to validate their most important product decisions with data. So to me, that was just mind blowing um, to see that. Um, to see that stat and it really shows, you know, we have a lot of work there to do as product leaders. So to sum it all up on why I think data and metrics is so important, why I'm so passionate about this topic as well, it's not just about, you know, measuring some onboarding funnels. To me, having better metrics and good data insights from those metrics really plays a fundamental role in measuring how we're impacting the business goals as well as create a deeper understanding, get closer to our customers with that data. And to take one step back again, why, are we, why do we need to do this in the first place? It really allows us to make better product decisions and through that stay more competitive. Um, as you know, there like, especially these days, there are so many different products uh, that our customers can choose from. So really the closer you are, to your customers through good metrics and analyzing their customer behavior through data, as well as impacting your business objectives in a positive way through your product uh, actions, the more likely you'll be able to grow the company, grow the business and, and stay competitive in this very competitive market. So I hope this gives you a bit of an insight first on why I, I really care so deeply about this topic is really about the customer impact and the business impact, ultimately. Okay, so now that we have this kind of hopefully fundamental understanding, um, I want to go into some fundamentals on uh, metrics best practices. So really, what pitfalls are there to avoid? Um, how do you define good metrics? And then on the back of that, how do you also get better insights from your metrics so you can make better product decisions. And the first area, it might sound, a few of those things might sound like metrics 101 and kind of basic to you guys. Um, but believe me, when I say that, I see people make these mistakes almost on a daily basis still uh, in larger companies and smaller companies I work with. Um, so I really think it's good sometimes to take a step back get your metrics fundamentals right, and then you can really uh, get more value from those. So here is an example graph um, that was, I won't name the product um, company, but that was a graph I've actually set up uh, several years ago on one of my metrics dashboards. Um, and so what it showed was the total number of signups over 30 days. So we just launched, it was a B2B product. Um, we just launched a market, started running some ads. So we, I wanted to see, you know, who's signing up, how many people are signing up to our product. And so this was the graph we were kind of looking at on a day-to-day basis. And I want to put this on you guys now for a second uh, as one of the first exercises. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys I will, I will spoil it. This graph wasn't very useful to look at, and I'll tell you in a second why. But I'd love to hear from you guys. What do you think is 
is not so great about looking at this type of graph um, on a daily basis. So again, um, I'll give you a few seconds to uh, go into the chat and enter some of um, some ideas or some comments. Um, I'd love to hear what's wrong with this graph um, and why is this not very useful? <laughs> nice, first one's coming in. It's a vanity metric, um, love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, very good question, Shane. Um, does this mean we are doing well or bad? I'll give you a few more seconds for any more comments on why this isn't the best graph to look at. Yep, good point. We don't know how many people does this represent. Um, I have taken this out just for the sake of this presentation. Yep, love the idea, Carl, to have a percentage of existing users or easy target users. Nice. Um, yeah, so uh, reading the comments, um, really great to see you guys are um, exactly reflecting what I had to learn <laughs> kind of on a through the hard way. Um, so we looked at this graph on a daily basis and we kind of felt really good, right? Like this graph was always going up and um, we, we saw there was momentum, new customers signing up, which was great. What really happened was this. <laughs> we had lots of signups, but after the 30 day trial of those customers ended, <laughs> no one actually uh, converted to paying customers. So even though this graph uh, and someone said this, uh, Jerry said this uh, nicely here in this first comment, um, this was really a vanity metric, right? Um, what makes a vanity metric? It's great for stakeholder presentations because it looks good. It makes us feel good as well, right? We were happy people were signing up. This graph was always going up. Worst case, it can only stagnate if we don't get any more new customer signups, but it can never go down, right? Like it can never look bad. Um, I think I also saw uh, someone else put this in the comments. It doesn't give us any insight whether we're doing well or not. We have no notion of what is our goal, uh, what is our conversion to paying customers. Um, and despite us looking at this, uh, at this graph quite frequently, um, it took us like a couple months after all these trial kind of trials expired to find out that actually we weren't doing well at all. So I want to share, um, so thanks everyone for the comments. This is a great warm up and we'll have a couple more of those. Um, I wanted to share a few more popular vanity metrics that I do see in the day to day. And some, I'm not saying you shouldn't look at those at all or there's absolutely no value, but just think about, is this really what you're going to base your actions off or is there something more useful, more insightful you can track? So often um, people will look at page views, the number of visitors, your followers and likes on uh, your social channels, uh, time spent on site, uh, or number of downloads. You can see a lot of these metrics actually still come from kind of the website and Google Analytics days. And I still see them uh, come up quite often in product teams as well. Um, there are cases where you might want to look at your um, users like session length, for example, if you're Netflix and you have an entertainment product where you want people to watch lots of content that might be useful uh, in another case where you have a productivity tool like I don't know a CRM tool where it should be easy to enter like a new customer um, maybe you don't want to look at session length because it might mean that they're not getting the job done in um, a fast manner so just some vanity metrics to look out for in the day-to-day -day. Um, and what I recommend is just if you look at your current dashboards um, or your current metrics that you're tracking in the day-to-day, -day, um, check those against these uh, the, this good metrics checklist that I created. So first of all, we just talked about it, no vanity metrics. Your job or the metrics job uh, to be done here is to find the truth, right? You really wanna see, are we converting to paying customers or are we really solving a customer issue? Um, you know, like just looking at feel good metrics won't get you these insights. Your job is to find the truth. Then at, on the back of that, they need to be actionable. 
Um, so ask yourself with every metric you're tracking, does it change your behavior? Does it change your product roadmap or your decision-making in any way? If this graph goes up or this graph goes down, will you change anything? Will it um, create, is it actionable? Will it create any decisions? Um, a good way to make them more useful and uh, I saw Carl had that in the comments to make it maybe a percentage of um, something. Uh, so using ratios, I think is a really, really great way to make them a lot more actionable and insightful. So for example, uh, instead of just tracking my um, total signups as an aggregator sum, I could look at how many, uh, the percentage of customers who convert after the free trial, I could compare the number of signups with the customer acquisition costs, which gives me a ratio. So ratios or like finding, like comparing a number against something else is a really, really powerful way. So I often say use ratios um, or try to make, instead of a total number of something, try a ratio, um, compare it with something, it will make it a lot more insightful usually. Uh, then the next one is they need to be easy to understand as well. Um, so I often look at people's dashboards and they have these like crazy long event names with like five underscores and um, like it's so cryptic, like no one else but the person who actually implemented those uh, metrics or events uh, knows what each event actually means. So if you really want your team to get behind those uh, metrics and uh, if you really want to get uh, yeah, everyone to rally behind um, some of the things you're trying to measure, they need to be easy to understand. Um, that's really, really important. And then the last point to make your metrics more useful is a concept I call lead over lag. So lagging metrics is when you measure something that has already happened uh, and that is uh, still useful, but more so for kind of reporting purposes. So for example, at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter or the year, you might track your, uh, you know, how many, um, how much revenue you have made or how many customers have converted. It's kind of, it's, it's looking uh, back retrospectively. Um, again, useful for reporting purposes. However, they're not so useful usually in the day-to-day -day when you wanna really use your metrics to inform actions and maybe course correct on the way as well. So that's where leading metrics come in. And so I'll share an example um, of a great leading metric that I like to use, um, which is an activation metric. Um, so if you look at your customers signing up to your product and let's say in the first seven days, um, what are they doing in your product? Are they getting any value out of their product uh, in that first, uh, period of using it, that often informs, and you can usually find some correlations later on with your long-term retention of those customers. This is a great way to gauge, are they likely to stick around in the long-term? Are they seeing the value when they're signing up, when they're starting to use your product? So that's a great way. Uh, so I often tell people, find the earliest indicators of your customers on whether they get value from your product. For example, through an activation metric. Um, those, that's a great example of a leading metric. There is, um, there is a great book I do want to add in here uh, from the Lean series. Uh, it's called the Lean Analytics uh, book from Ben Yoskowitz. If you do want to go deeper into uh, some of those fundamentals, I highly recommend his book. It's a, it's a great read. I've gone through it a few times now. Okay, so let's go back to um, my total number of signups graph. Uh, I'm keen to hear from you guys, so please pop back into the chat. Um, after some of these things we talked about in the good mix metrics checklist, what are the things I could do better uh, about this graph? I'll give you a few seconds again. How would you change this graph on my dashboard? And we already had some great suggestions earlier, so maybe just build on that. Nice ratio of paying to signups. Yep, that was exactly what I did <laughs> after I had this um, kind of realization moment. Nice, any other ideas? Filter to fee paying only and daily active users. Yep, daily active users, uh, more of an engagement metric. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, 
Yes, love it, Shane. Um, so really, again, going back to the checklist, you want to make things comparable, put them into context, right? So just this graph in isolation, not very useful. If I now compare even just the total number with the previous 30 days, it's already a lot more useful um, to see whether we're improving or not. Awesome. Okay. Love the idea. I think you guys um, uh, understand the metrics fundamentals. So uh, let's move on to the second area, um, which is a concept that sounds counterintuitive to some people, but uh, I will hear me out. <laughs> um, I always say don't track too much. Um, I can't recount how many times I've been asked by stakeholders to just track absolutely everything in my application, and then we'll figure out what to measure uh, and what to actually look for in those um, events later on. And what happened usually is that we end up with this um, incredible, overwhelming amount of different events. Like if people go into their settings and change some like little setting, uh, it would trigger like five different events or when they do read the FAQs or whatever action they take in our product, everything would trigger lots of different events. And... <laughs> That might sound great, but we really ended up with an overwhelming amount of events. It was hard to maintain and actually we weren't getting much value from it. So our stakeholders would then go, well, we have so much data. We need to dig deeper into this data because they're still not seeing any value from all of those insights. And it also really makes it hard to maintain. Uh, and then you start to get errors in your data and then people actually start to lose trust. Um, so I really like using the, it's called the data wheel of death from uh, Reed Forge or Brian Balfour, I think is a great illustration of this. Um, when you have too many events, too many things being tracked in your product, it's hard to maintain your data, it's not consistently maintained, then the data becomes flawed uh, and irrelevant, people start to lose trust, they use the data less, and then the cycle kind of continues from there. Um, and so it's a pretty predictable cycle. And this is not just my experience. I listened to, there was a great talk actually from um, the, I think it was a VP of data from uh, EA, Electronic Arts, a few years ago. Um, he was brought in to kind of redo their data and tracking platforms and, and methods. And um, he shared that, he didn't say which, which game it was, but I'm assuming it was one of their large global games like FIFA or whatever, um, where they couldn't even track how many people were logging in every day on their various platforms because on Xbox, on PlayStation, on the different like mediums where they launched their, their games, they had just like slight spelling mistakes in how they track the login, login event. Sometimes it'd be uppercase, lowercase, sometimes it's an underscore versus a dash. So just those little spelling mistakes made it impossible for them to track like a really basic user action. So I just wanted to stress this happens all the time. Uh, so really focus on getting fewer metrics in or fewer events that you're tracking in your product and really maintain that data uh, really, really well so you don't lose trust in your data. So why not track everything? And it, you're also creating less focus, right? When you have so many things to look at, it's, it can be really overwhelming. Uh, as we just talked about the second point, you're creating more errors and less trust when things start to become inaccurate. And lastly, also, especially in a smaller company, you might be a bit more wary of this. It could get quite pricey. A lot of analytics tools, they actually charge you based on the volume of events that you're uh, tracking in the day to day. Um, so just think about that. It could really impact your pricing as well. <laughs> Um, sorry, just reading the comments on the site. Yes, it can get pricey. Okay, uh, plugging my own blog here. I actually went into this topic uh, in a little bit more detail as well, if you want to have a further read. So the point I'm trying to make here is we typically lack focus and having even more events in your product doesn't help with that. So start small, test those events properly and then expand. And really think about, and we'll go into this in the next section, really think about which metrics you really, really need to track. Focus on those, maintain them nicely. You'll get a lot more value and insights from them. Um, and to give you a practical example, um, and this is 
I think industry-wide best practice, uh, the analytics tool Amplitude has shared this as well. Uh, if you're starting, if you're just launching a new product or a new application, it's fine to just have 20 events tracking in your product. Just make sure those 20 events are really useful things you actually want to look at. Okay, so what are some of the important usage metrics that I see in the day to day or that I usually recommend. Um, it's actually simpler than many people think. So uh, in, in a smaller team, you know, you might look at all these metrics yourself as a product leader. In a larger organization, you might have different teams looking at uh, these different objectives. Um, so your acquisition metrics. Um, and what I mean here is not just number of downloads, but proper signups, right? Like how many people have fully signed up and are validated live users on your product. Uh, second one, we talked about it as a great example of a leading metric, your activation. What are the key actions your users take in the first three, seven days, um, whatever that time period is for, for your product um, on where they really get that kind of aha effect, like the key app, this is how I get value out of the product. Um, then engagement. Uh, and retention. Uh, often people, <laughs> I see people often mix those two up. Uh, they are actually two very separate metrics, both very important. So your engagement is more like how frequently your customers are coming back and using your product. So this is usually where you use your daily active users or monthly active users, um, depending on what that kind of frequent frequency or cadence is of your customers using your product. Um, and then retention, looks more at the long term, when are they churning or how long are they sticking with your product? Are they dropping off after a month of using it, after three months? How many customers are still active after certain periods of time? Um, so yeah, just wanted to stress, these are two different metrics for two different purposes to track. And then you might have a more business specific metric. Uh, this really now depends on your product. Um, if you have a marketplace product like Amazon, you might want to measure um, you know, the activity or the onboarding of sellers uh, and merchants. And you know, it could be your technical performance, uh, anything that is really specific to your business that really impacts the customer and the business goal is, is what you can put in here. So acquisition, activation, engagement, retention, and then add you know, one or two really business specific metrics that are really important. These are usually like the, the basic metrics I would recommend to track. So it really doesn't need that much to get really good insights about your customers. All right, and then the third um, kind of metrics fundamentals area I wanted to talk about, and we, I touched on this at the start, is how do we now link the product and the business metrics? So we learned about, you know, just fundamentals, what does a good metric look like? Um, a concept of, you know, not tracking too much, focusing on the right things, but how do we actually define what are those right metrics and how do we bridge that gap between the product and the business? So I want to start with this great quote from Brian Balfour. Um, he runs the Reforge series, um, which by the way, is, is amazing product content um, if you haven't heard of it yet. Um, so he said it quite nicely, your metrics are a reflection of your strategy, right? As we talked about before, your metrics, it's not just about measuring some onboarding funnels and how many people are using my feature. Um, it's really about linking the product and the business together and creating this holistic view. So what I want to encourage product leaders is to really get a deep understanding of the business goals, whatever it is, um, Every company will have, you know, the company vision and their purpose, and then there will be some sort of financial goal or growth goal uh, that they've set for, let's say, the year typically. Uh, so let's say your business goal is growing your revenue by X. Now you can create uh, a product North Star, and I'll explain how this all links back to the other metrics we talked about in a second. Um, a product North Star is a really, really powerful tool to kind of start translating that business goal, because growing revenue by uh, a certain amount is not usually very actionable or inspiring for product teams to work towards, right? So you need to translate to, um, to a metric that reflects a bit more on of how your customers are using your product and then how does that link back to your business goal? How does this generate more revenue? So what you'll find is a lot of product North Stars, they are actually all about the 
the frequent engagement of their target customer or their paying customer um, or whatever their primary kind of target is. So the product North Star is basically the, the missing link or a metric that will help you connect the business and the product goals. So if you then put it into this, and I like using this one pager here, uh, I call it the business and product metrics one pager, um, you have your business goal, then you translate it into a product North Star. And then you think about those like lower level metrics, like your acquisition activation metric, your engagement, your retention, and so on and so forth, and how that contributes to that North Star and ultimately to the business goal. So my point here is that if you're working on a feature or a product change, and it's meant to uh, improve your engagement metric, um, you need to be, as a product leader, you need to be really clear on how this connects to the wider product North Star and the business goal, right? Like it's your job to kind of connect all these uh, different metrics and, and have this holistic view. So that's usually a good litmus test. If you're uh, working on a small feature change, can you explain and communicate clearly how does it impact the customer through the North Star and the business goal? So your product North Star um, is really there to represent the value, and we'll go into a few more um, examples in a second. Um, the product North Star is meant to represent the value your customers are getting from the product, and it acts as a link of your product usage and your business metric. And what makes a good North Star, um, it, uh, well, we just talked about it, it really has to be value representing. Um, Going back to one of the, the principles we talked about earlier, it needs to be a leading indicator for business outcomes, right? So just like tracking a revenue number is usually uh, a lagging metric. So the product North Star is a perfect place to put a more leading metric um, into place. So the frequent engagement on a weekly basis, for example, can tell you usually a lot about how um, much it will impact your revenue further down the line. Um, and it also needs to be something that is easy to understand and provides kind of really strategic focus right like it, it has to be something that everyone can get behind everyone can understand and then everyone in the various product teams can kind of optimize towards this product north star in the day to day but let's go through some examples uh and by the way they are hypothetical examples um they are not the real examples. I don't know what the, the real North Stars are, but I think they're pretty good guesses on what they could be. Um, so Netflix, um, I mentioned it briefly before, it's, it's an entertainment or an, uh, it's an entertainment product. So you do want your customers to engage with your content as frequently as possible um, and as long as possible. Uh, so as a product leader, what you could measure as a North Star hypothetically is um, the number of subscribers watching more than X hours of content per month. Okay, so let's go through, and this is where you guys come back into the chat, hopefully to um, share some ideas. Uh, what could be a product North Star for Amazon? Um, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and uh, please put your ideas into the chat. If you were a product leader for Amazon, what would you track? What would you define potentially as your product North Star metric? Uh, it's Amazon, the e-commerce platform, yeah, the shopping experience. Great first suggestion from Shane, um, number of prime subscriptions. Monthly sales profit per person. Okay, um, that's a great suggestion as well. It is more of, uh, so the monthly sales, it is more of a business metric again, um, which I think is extremely useful by the way, you're putting it into a ratio. Um, what I would say is think about is this the value that your customers are getting from it? Your product North Star really needs to represent kind of the, the value they're getting from your product. Um, so your customers, I think, won't usually think of the sales or the margin they're giving to Amazon. Okay, uh, great suggestion. Number of guests checking out per month. 
or per day. Yep. Cool. I'll wait a couple more seconds for some more ideas. Uh, again, think about what is the engagement metric maybe that uh, you could measure from your um, Amazon customers. Cool. Good question. I hope we can cover that later. <laughs> I won't ignore it. We'll get back to it later. Um, cool. Okay. So I can, <laughs> uh, I can see, um, so there's an awesome suggestion. Um, what I would say is, and again, the product North Star, it's not about your your revenue metrics. These are your wider business goals that you're tracking towards, but you need to translate it back into customer behavior and customer value. Um, so to me, like a really good indicator would be of how many times me as a customer, I, I purchase something on a monthly basis. And to make it even more specific, uh, I think someone put that into the comment actually um, at the start, you could look at your prime customers uh, specifically. Um, so if I was the product leader, I would think about who are my most engaged customers uh, or my primary audience, um, their prime subscribers uh, could be a good um, target customer to focus on. And then how, how do I measure the value they get from Amazon uh, through, for example, how the, the number of purchases per month or per week? Um, that would be a starting point. Okay, so... Uh, again, think about the value. I cannot stress this enough. Let's go through another example. Um, Uber Eats, uh, so just food delivery app. Uh, again, what will be, as a cust if, if you put yourself in the customer's shoes, how do you get the most value? Uh, what is the value you're getting from Uber Eats? And then as a product leader, again, how can you measure that value? And how is that linked maybe also to the business goal? So please put your ideas in the chat again. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys would come up with as a product North Star. Cool. Um, conversion funnels from search to purchase, I think is um, a really, really important metric to track. I would say it's more of an... Um, probably more in the uh, activation or um, acquisition kind of metric. It's probably not the wider North Star. Uh, number of meals delivered, uh, great suggestion. Um, that is definitely something that really represents the value that your customers are getting from it. <laughs> number of calories delivered. Uh, nice, Scott, uh, number, is it? North Star, percentage of customers reordering per month. Uh, really great idea as well. I think that's where you really look at your stickiness. And um, clearly, if your customers are returning on a monthly basis, that means that your product is useful. They like your pro using your product. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, yep, another good one, Jerry. Number of repeat meals delivered. Um, completely agree. That is not the example. I chose, but I think that would also be a really valid North Star. Uh, and again, we're just throwing hypothetical examples into it. Yeah, um, I think the average number of deliveries done by drivers per month, I am very certain they will be tracking this somehow as well. I don't know if that would be the, the overarching North Star because it just focuses on the drivers, um, not on the main customer um, but I think it would be one of the business specific metrics maybe that I would definitely suggest to track um, because it shows the engagement of your uh, delivery drivers which in a marketplace like this this is really important um, okay again love the suggestions um, the one I chose here and I mean this is, there's no right or wrong really these are just some of my ideas um, and I think there were some really valid ideas in the chat as well um, so the one I chose here as an example is the percentage of orders delivered on time per customer. Uh, so why have I chosen this? 
um, if I think about the, the value of something like Uber Eats, it's the convenience for me. I don't have to leave. Uh, maybe I just, I'm short on time during my lunch break and I just want to get something delivered. But sometimes what happens is I get like it's delayed and then it rolls into like my meeting that I had scheduled after lunch. And now I have to eat while I'm uh, in the meeting already. And it's just a really not so nice experience. So as a product leader, you could, for example, track the percentage of orders delivered on time per customer. That includes kind of the, the driver's efficiency. It includes the, the um, value your customers are getting out of it. Um, and with and that could be, I think, a nice leading indicator to how many people will stick to your product in the long term and therefore keep paying for your services. Um, cool. So I love all these suggestions. Thank you so much for um, all the great ideas and participating. Uh, let's recap quickly. What is a good North Star metric? It represents the value your customers get. It's a leading indicator. So make sure you don't put a lagging kind of financial or reporting metric in here uh, because you want it to be actionable. You want to look at it and say, this is not going so well. Let's change something in the product rather than having to wait for your financial numbers to tell you at the end of the year. Um, and it also needs to be something that is easy. Those are all easy to understand examples that we've gone through. Um, and this will really help you get kind of provide the strategic focus. Um, and just to bring it all together again, really, you want to have this holistic view. Um, what are your financial goals? For example, growing your revenue or improving your margin. What is your product North Star? For example, the engagement of your paying customers. And then you can break it down into the lower level uh, metrics around your activation, your engagement, your retention, and so on and so forth. Cool. Um, so I hope this all makes sense and uh, I'll wrap up over the next couple of minutes to then move into a Q&A where we can go into any more details. Um, so as a summary of what we learned today, um, having better metrics and good data insights, it's a, it really plays a fundamental role in measuring how we're impacting the business and the customer. And it allows us to make better decisions. And remember, why are we doing this? all of this in the first place? It's not just for the sake of measuring things. Uh, it's really so we can stay more competitive in market. Okay, so really think about the customer and the business benefit. And this is why we talk, we, the metrics part is so important. So link your product and your business metrics through a North Star that everyone can rally behind. Um, always work backwards from the business goals. I do see teams sometimes um, have, you know, come up with a different product goals. Like one team would be have defined their own acquisition goal. The other one focus on retention, but they're not often, they're not like linked into the wider picture. And then when it comes to prioritization of resources or, or focus in the company, it's really hard to decide, you know, which team should get which resources because they haven't been considered in the wider picture. Uh, so again, this, this holistic view, really connecting the dots between the different uh, metrics and goals is, is just absolutely critical. Don't track too much, even if it sounds counterintuitive. You really want to start small, focus on met good metrics uh, that really give you useful insights about your product uh, and your progress. Um, so don't overdo it. Start small, but do it properly. And... Uh, use the, the metrics checklist that we went through um, earlier to just check the metrics that you are looking at in the day-to-day. -day. You know, are they really actionable? Can you make them more comparable? Are they leading indicators rather than kind of lagging metrics? Uh, so really um, use those points to check all your current metrics you might already be looking at in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, cool, I think um, it's time now to go into a bit more Q&A um, and uh, maybe lastly before I hand over back to Scott um, for the Q&A uh, I wanted to share um, today I think we talked about a lot of kind of fundamentals how to define the right metrics um, once you've gone through that there are a few more things that uh, I just couldn't pack into this hour I could talk about this for quite a long time um, but if you do want to learn more, I have launched an ebook recently, The Insights Driven Product Manager, which you can find on insightsdrivenpm.com. Uh, it's an ebook I launched on Gumroad, um, which gives you really practical uh, tips. Some of them we talked about today, but it also goes a bit deeper into 
Now, when you track those metrics uh, that we talked about today, how can you actually put this into nice like narratives? How can you really share it with stakeholders? How can you inspire action? Uh, how can you know they really understand the insights and, and, and kind of the learnings from your metrics? So I'll go, uh, I'm going into a few of those examples in the book if you want to learn more about this. Um, you can also, please always feel free to message me on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn directly. Uh, I yeah, love hearing different war stories and uh, challenges from product leaders. And um, I always try to reply and help uh, where I can. Uh, so yeah, so please do connect with me. Uh, all right, uh, maybe over to Scott then for a few more questions. Oh, awesome, thank you very much for, for the great, uh, great session and great talk today. Um, I plugged a link to your uh, book on Gumroad in the uh, chat there. If anybody wants to uh, check it out, I highly encourage them. It's a really fantastic read. I had a chance to take a look through it. And I know you've got some other good little exercises and tools in there as well, too, that teams can uh, can utilize on that side. So definitely worth a, worth a peek. Um, and we've got to spend a little bit of time on some Q&A. So I encourage everybody to head over to the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, you can toss your questions in there in the meantime, um, just to maybe slightly add to the topic today of analytics. Um, I'll also plunk some details inside our chat here. We did release a new capability today uh, with integration with Amplitude and Mixpanel with Product Board, which allows you to bring together both your qualitative and your quantitative data, um, really bringing a lot of richness to some of these decisions. So I think, again, the teams that are really interested in analytics capabilities and uh, really excited about the, uh, the, the, the promise that this can bring uh, to teams and, and the capabilities on that side. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm going to kick things off while maybe we're waiting for some of the Q&A questions. Again, people can pop those inside uh, the Q&A section. Um, you talked a lot today about a lot of different factors, but I guess what I'm really interested in is like, like why teams seem to stumble on this pattern between like setting a proper, you know, proper metric or proper goal and establishing proper measurement. And like, maybe is there, is there a, a common anti-pattern maybe that you see inside there that they, 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 repeat over and over and over in product teams and product organizations that stops them from really doing this this job very well yeah um yes i do and i think it goes back into the psychology really of and the environment that they're sometimes in right so often um product teams or product leaders don't feel safe because i think if you do metrics properly it reveals a lot of ugly stuff um <laughs> i was in a situation once where um you know, I, I, we just launched a B2B product of targeting small businesses. Um, and we, I had, a, I had a chart that looked at like end day retention. So basically after day one, how many people are still there? After day two, how many people are still using the product? And day three was like 1% and day four was zero. So it was just like horrendous. Like we just launched and I was like, oh my God, like after day three, literally everyone has left the product and platform is not coming back. Um, so, you know, the, some of those metrics really reveal the truth and the truth is not always pretty. And I think a lot of, a lot of leaders really are sta business stakeholders. I think they, you know, they're maybe not encouraging uh, or maybe not share, maybe they're open to it, but maybe they're not always sharing like, Hey, this is a safe environment. I do want you to bring up those ugly truths to me and vice versa product leaders. Sometimes, you know, they just don't feel confident enough um, and they'd rather kind of please the stakeholders. And uh, so they're not really speaking up and sharing those truths. So they'd rather put, you know, and I've done that, done that before, I fully admit it, put this like nice uh, upward trending uh, <laughs> total sign up graph on my presentation. You know, it just makes it look good. And yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's hard. So it's, I, I completely get it why. And um, it's just, I think both product leaders need to do more work, but also maybe for, you know, the wider business leadership, really ensure people know it's a safe environment. They should bring up those metrics. They should really track those real numbers because that I'd, I'd rather look at those now than find out in three years, hey, you know, the product, it's not going anywhere. We didn't reach our goals. Um, yeah, yeah. Because, no, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a really, really great point. <laughs> I think the, the vulnerability inside product teams and being more exposed is not a bad thing. I think, unfortunately, yeah. in many teams, it's viewed as a bad thing, right? So yeah. we kind of avoid it. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. I'm going to jump over to maybe a question that was asked in the chat, not so much in the Q&A, but we're waiting for some Q&A questions to come in as well from everybody. But what do you advise uh, to pre-client startups who are getting pressure 
to add metrics tracking before they have users. So I guess this is somebody where they're probably- Oh, I see, yeah, pre-launch. Pre -live. Yeah, pre-launch, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, uh, I've had this discussion before actually. So it's, it's funny that someone asked that, um, great question. So I, I really think you should think about your metrics from the very start. Um, I've been involved in a lot of like new product launches and the first time I've done it, you know, it was like an afterthought, like we launched and they're like, oh shit, we need to put in some metrics and then measure, you know, but really, if you're really thinking about what are the business goals, what are we trying to, uh, well, we, what do we want our users to do, which is your, where your product North Star comes in, it actually defines what, how you're building the product in the first place, right? So if you see metrics more as a strategic tool, rather than an afterthought of just you know, putting in some events and, and measuring things uh, once you're launched. Um, I think, yeah, so going back, you can unlock a lot more value if you're using your metrics more to define your focus. It actually, it, it defines what you're building in the first place. Um, so in the first couple months of, you know, where we're still ideating, I usually run a product North Star workshop just to get people thinking, what, what is this metric that we're going to optimize towards? And then you review your MVP feature set again and see, are those things actually going to contribute to this North Star or not? And that can be a really nice strategic guidance for you, even pre-launch. So yes, to your question, definitely think about it from the very start. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I'm going to trail off with one last question, maybe before we kind of wrap up. I know we're coming up closer to the hour for people, but Thinking a little bit about the, the book in particular, I think you had some really great points inside there. And one of the conversations you had was with John Cutler, I think at one point inside there that you flagged. And you talked a little bit about the different modes, a confirmative, mm. a scientist, a progress, and a, and a focus. I wonder maybe if, if, like, if you had to kind of think of each of those different modes and think about the life cycle that we go through as product managers and in, in measuring success or failure, like what's we're, we're, maybe a, a best mode to kind of start in if you're if you're kind of putting this on is it more around the being the scientist and thinking of those yeah. patterns and opportunities is it more around the confirming side and making sure that we've actually you know gotten to an outcome or conclusion is it you know something else I'm curious if there's one maybe in there that kind of surfaces as like start yeah. here, this would be a great place um well, no, that puts you a bit on the spot. Sorry. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just thinking like it's it's a worse like response from we get from all product managers. It depends. It, it depends. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. It really depends on the life cycle stage of of your product and what your current problems are. Right, like uh, a lot of times um, I see teams maybe they have a product in market already, and you know they have a million things and initiatives going on. They're lacking focus. Clearly, they maybe don't have this overarching north star. So in that case, I say you know use the the focus mode of metrics is is the important one for you guys. But, or, okay, another example is you have a mature product in market, right? So you've, you've kind of gone through like the growth phase and you have an established mature client base. And now you're thinking, how do we innovate? How do we create like maybe an adjacent offering to our product? Like how do we explore where, which market or which kind of offering should we tackle next? That's where I think that scientist mode can be super useful. Um, I can share one example on this um, where we launch like... Um, uh, a payment product uh, several years ago and um, we thought you know we had a hypothesis of the target customer that will be using this product and just by kind of not even we weren't going into the data, the data for a specific question or with a specific purpose we were kind of like yeah like a scientist like kind of just weeding through kind of having a nosy around we found there was like this really bizarre use case that people use this payment platform for that I would have never thought about and so now we're like, okay, can we build like an adjacent offering <laughs> based on this finding, right? So if you're trying to innovate, maybe expand your product offering, go into scientist mode. Uh, I know I talked a lot about here, your metrics and just track that. In that case, I go, I say, just explore, see what interesting things you do find in that moment. Yeah, perfect. That's wonderful. Um, I apologize. I'm having a little bit of internet problems at home. So I'm like, literally, as you were oh. answering that question, I was like scrambling to try to figure out things <laughs> and make sure that I could stay on. I was like, oh no, I'm going to like end and disappear. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought you had a rush to. Looking around. No, yeah. <laughs> no, it was all good. It was like, oh no, like we're going to crash. Um, thank you very much for today, I think, Karina. I think it was, it was a really, really great session, really, really great talk. And I, I super appreciate everything you brought today uh, in terms of knowledge sharing and, and, and all the help essentially that we've got on the side. So 
again, much, much appreciated on that end. Um, I'm just going to cut off and kind of close over here on things. Um, unfortunately, again, because of my little internet challenges here, I might not be able to share the slides I was intending to share, but overall, I uh, encourage you to fill out our post event survey. I put a link there in the chat for everybody, welcoming you uh, certainly to share your feedback on today's event. We're always looking to get better in terms of the programming that we do and the work that we do on this side. And I know Karina would love to hear a little bit of your thoughts too uh, on the feedback on, what, on, on the session today. Um, and encourage you as well to you know, come to the product makers community and share some of your thoughts on our uh, other conversations, open up a topic, ask questions about these things. Again, we're here to help each other and uh, we kind of float the boat and lift our, our quality of work that we do as product managers uh, by working together and, and sharing different ideas. We've also got lots of different events coming up. So I encourage you to check those out. A number uh, that happen each week on Thursdays here in the product makers community and lots of different ways in which you can get involved in it, including our round tables, opportunities to speak as a, as a speaker here at, at the sessions and uh, a lot of other ways again to, to engage here in our, in our product makers community. So thank you again very much and uh, a wonderful, wonderful talk and really appreciate the time and energy today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun and yeah, I, was, I just put it in the chat. Like thanks everyone for participating in my few exercises. I absolutely loved um, your ideas and comments. So thank you all. Thanks for oh, having that's me. That's awesome. All right, no problem. Thanks very much. All right, thank you.